So let's get started. Uh, my name is Carlos Santana. I'm with AWS. I'm a uh, EKS specialist, solutions architect. Um, I work with a lot of customers, uh, mainly around EKS, but building platforms. And happy to be here in Vancouver. So this is my first time in Canada. Well, came back, went to Niagara Falls for one day, so I don't think that counts. So this is, this is the time I'm spending two weeks here. Uh, happy to see a lot of familiar folks that I see online and now I can see them in person. Um, so I've been, um, so before we start, um, this is what I found for the people follow me on Twitter. I was asking like, what do Canadian people eat? And like Nicholas said like ruffles and then another person ruffles. So I just went, found some ruffles and then another person says uh, this candy. So if you have more tips for that, uh, send me that. The other thing is um, who's on Blue Sky app? Blue Sky app, who wants to be on the Blue Sky app? So I got my invite this morning. So the only thing that I will ask is please take a picture, that money shot of me presenting, and then I can show it to my boss uh, that said that I was actually here. Uh, if not, just come to me and talk to me, very, very introvert. So just uh, come to me, at, let's talk about GitOps, uh, ECAS, platform engineering, cross-plane, backstage, all those things, and then at the end of tomorrow, I'll decide um, who I posted or, or, or post something in Twitter and then, uh, and then ping me. So I just need to pick one person. So let's get started with, um, my title was too big. I think I was the longest title in the agenda. I feel ashamed now. Um, I should be, getter, be better at submitting CFPs. Um, so I just shorted it into, this talk is going to be about disaster recovery, which is a topic that comes up when people are using cross-plane and then teach you a, bit of, a little bit about cross-plane. So the, whole, the new hotness now is uh, platform engineering, like it was DevOps before that, like it was ITIL. Who remembers ITIL? Okay, what's the, the hotness? So in terms of uh, platform engineering, the, the thing that I, I usually use is uh, GitOps as a practice. And that's the one thing that actually people are clicking in their head of saying, that one I can start with. So. So if everything starts with GitOps, and this is GitOps gone, then platform engineering, I think it, it follows a, a better conversation on how people can get started of building platforms for their internal developers uh, or inter internal teams. And then the thing is, GitOps, um, this, this morning people were saying in the, in the keynote that GitOps is not for Kubernetes, but GitOps runs on Kubernetes. So the controllers that we have today and, and in open source are based on Kubernetes, which is, has your desired state, desired state and current state reconcile, but they run in Kubernetes. The thing is, a lot of the people that I talk to, they, don't, they want to deploy more things than Kubernetes. Some folks that I talk to, um, end users, they actually don't run any workloads on Kubernetes. For example, I don't want to, uh, functions, like serverless functions, <laughs> let's say. Uh, or the type of uh, compute. But the, what they want are looking for is guidance on how do I deploy those dependencies that the workloads need, like a database, uh, like an S3 bucket, object storage, um, and then the, thing, the things associated with it. Uh, so it's not just an S3 bucket or an RDS or some other cloud resources, is those things need to be configured with AIM, and then they need to configure in a VPC, and it needs to be configured with their networking. So it becomes very uh, entangled of the way they configure that, but they want to have the experience of GitOps, of a simple YAML, high level abstraction that says, just give me a database, just give me an object, object store, and just make it available to my app, to my pod. And this is where things like Crossplane and ACK, and Crossplane is a CNCF uh, project, in incubation, uh, there's multiple companies contributing into it. And there's another open source project from my company called ACK. Uh, they do similar things of reconciling that YAML that you have in Git or from GitOps um, and making so that you have those infrastructures that are outside Kubernetes reconcile, meaning the RDS database, the S3 bucket, uh, VPCs. Um, actually, we have folks deploying and I think Dan mentioned that in, in his talk, deploying Kubernetes from Kubernetes. Look at that. <laughs> you have a YAML that says, I want a Kubernetes cluster with these characteristics. 
Um, and then you give it to a controller, which happens to run in Kubernetes, but the idea is GitOps is the main idea of deploying those infrastructure. So the next thing that we do is the YAML, and everybody can, can, can laugh and say whatever they have to say about YAML. I started working with Terraform deeply in production three months ago. I like YAML. Um, that's, that's the only thing I would say. But a lot of people use Terraform, and that's something also that I'm working on. If you happen to be here and want to talk, talk to, I want to create kind of like um, a pattern in the Argo CD community of like, how do we bridge uh, Terraform to Argo? But anyway, YAML is kind of like that declarative state that everybody uses to get to that uh, cloud uh, resources. But also uh, talking about YAML, and then if you like it or not like it, there's other abstractions coming up, and there's another CNCF project called Backstage, which is used as a kind of developer portal. It's written in, in React Native, uh, React, um, that allows you to bootstrap and also like get back information for developers to create um, the pattern that I'm seeing, at least the one that I'm working on, is create those Git repos that have the YAML templatized. So you can ask you, like, what are the inputs? Like, what are the type of app that you want? It could be Java or Python. Um, what is the region? Um, how big is the cluster? How big is the database? And just with that metadata in a nice GUI format, you can tell Backstage, go ahead and get me a Git repo that then eventually you will need to manage with uh, your pull requests and collaboration on working on that Git repo, which reconciles your app in Kubernetes. If you have the app in Kubernetes, it could be the app running in something like Lambda or ACS or another cloud provider or on-premise. Um, we've seen uh, projects running HPC clusters on-premise deployed from YAML. So then it comes the other part that, um, at least this is the, the reason I did this, this, this talk was, Everything is about platform engineering, platform engineering, but the day that the RDS gets deleted by somebody click something the wrong way, or the way that um, there's a misconnection and something that um, connectivity problems or like brown, green um, networking happening in a certain region, uh, not that does usually don't happen, but availability zones. We have multiple availability zones in different cloud providers, and at least in my cloud provider, we have that. But let's say that even you're migrating from one region to another region, I'll use that use case, then it's not my problem anymore if I'm in the platform team or DevOps team. It's the SRE uh, engineering. Um, there's also there's, um, companies and end users that are not that big enough that they have the luxury of having a, de a development team, a platform team, an SRE team. So these tools and open source projects give you the abstraction and everybody, end users running in production are trying to come together into projects, open source projects to say, let's solve it once and everybody benefits from it. Uh, small shops and big shops can benefit from it. So this becomes the SRE engineering problem, but at the end of the day becomes an IT problem. You have to deal with it. Or if you have to do two uh, teams, uh, the platform team needs to collaborate with the SRE team saying like, hey, we're doing this cross plane thing. We're doing this YAML thing. You need to be aware that if something goes wrong, we need to work together to see how do we recover? Uh, what, what are the SLAs that we need to be aware of? Uh, if we're switching from deploying with Terraform, how do we recover with Terraform? And now how do we recover with Crossplane? And, and by the way, you can run Terraform inside Kubernetes with something like the Flux Terraform controller or the Crossplane Terraform provider. So Terraform can also be enabled for GitOps. Um, so let's talk about when we talked, if not for, we were not familiar with the SRN team uh, on the, uh, the thinking about uh, resiliency. So we have two aspects of resiliency, making an app resiliency, the dis disaster recovery aspect, and then the things that happen on, on one time events that it's okay to use. sometimes you have tasks or run books that you have to have manually because it's a one time event. And then we have the other aspect of resiliency where it's high availability. When you have, for example, in Kubernetes, you have an HPA configured that you have HA, or you have um, uh, Dan, you watch Dan's talk, he was talking about Argo CD, and in Argo CD, we have a seek scalability to make sure that we have better documentation around running Argo in production. Meaning, and one aspect is resiliency, running Argo in HA. 
Argo, Gargo it can be configured, um, and one of the easiest way to deploy Argo, I, I think, is Helm. It has all the values in there to enable HA, to put the requests uh, for the pods. And by the way, a lot of people get this confused, including myself, that HPAs are configured based on the request, not the limit. Um, you can put those values in there, and also Argo CD sharding, which is the Argo CD controller configured with multiple replicas if you have multiple clusters so that you can scale them uh, with many Argos managing the different uh, R, uh, Kubernetes clusters, um, scaling the Argo controller. So those are the type of things that we're working, just uh, pitching out the seek scalability that we're starting in Argo. So if you want to join, uh, we meet regularly and we're going to have some benchmarking. So if you want to contribute around that, uh, you're welcome to join. So talking, going back to disaster recovery, um, is things that happen that are not expected, right? When things happen, uh, if you have a cloud provider, um, they have all, all these aspect of resi resiliency in place for you to use. So we, we use that um, responsibility, um, share responsibility model where the cloud provider will give you all the tools. They're, they're sitting for you. Um, we have resiliency across of them, but you have to also configure them properly of like when you deploy something, make sure you configure them with anti-affinity. So the pods land in different um, availability zones. But disaster recovery is around those things that are unexpected. And uh, based on my experience, I can say that when we have a CVE event or LLC event, um, my experience based not just in AWS, but other companies I've worked with uh, for the past years is everything fails all the time. And the, the thing with disaster recovery or when things happen like that is they happen all the time, but it's not like zero and one. It's usually like it works and then it doesn't work or it works halfway or and then it doesn't work halfway or it works for this, these nodes and not for these other ones. And the time that you spend to figure out why it's not work, not not failing completely because that's the way that we design it, that's where you lose, you lose time to recover. So that's one aspect to, to learn, like if you have not done it before, um, is where you have better, better um, chance for success if you talk to the folks that are involved with that, the SRE engineering team. Uh, this, so re recovery objective, so this is kind of the, uh, we were mentioning ITO and DevOps practices on the two aspects that you have, like um, how much data am I going to lose when I recover? Or meaning like, yeah, how, many, how much data are going to be lose? Meaning that when you recover on the new place, you don't have that data or that transaction, so that thing that you were uh, configuring in terms, of, in, in, in terms of a database, it depends how often you configure backups. So if you configure the backup for for one hour increments, right, you, and something happened, it could be that you lost one hour of, of data. And that is um, the aspect that we call RPO, uh, recovery, recovery point. And then the other aspect is how fast do you recover? Um, meaning the downtime, that you have the, the system back and up. So those are the two, two, two um, times or metrics that you have to be uh, aware when we talk about objectives and building your SLOs or service level objectives or um, agreements. The next one is um, a spectrum. So when people talk about, and in this, this, comes, this comes into uh, conversations around cross-plane, they seem generic, but a lot of folks are looking for specific answers when you're working with things like Argo or Flux or GitOps or cross-plane on disaster recovery. And I go back to, to them and we have a conversation and we looking, we're talking about the same thing that we're talking about if we're not using Kubernetes at all on um, how much are you willing to pay to get that one side of the spectrum, I'll say the, the right side, uh, the multi-active active, like I'm willing to, to spend uh, a lot of resources to have duplicates and everything's active, active to reduce that RTO to almost nothing versus I don't have the luxury to spend that many resources to have a duplicate or the cloud provider may have also avenues of having that active active. Uh, I'll mention one of them with S3 bucket. But if, for example, a database uh, or the type of database that you're using, you can have a luxury for different environments. It could be dev or staging 
or a, a, a new environment that is for a new project that is not in production, that is okay to have one hour, 30 minutes until you create a new database and take, and take the snapshot and then put it back or the full backup and restore the database. So creating the database can take 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, getting the backup um, apply can take maybe five minutes or, or three minutes. It depends how much data that you have. But it's okay that you, you, you're recovering that uh, RTO is higher because it's a lower environment or it's okay or it's not being used or it's a window. Or you're just migrating from one region to another. So let's uh, talk about a little bit about uh, crossplane, and, and this is something that um, I'm involving in crossplane in terms of uh, as a cloud provider, um, providing guidance of um, how to do backup restore for our end users, and hopefully bring this this into the documentation. Um, but one aspect of in crossplane, when you install crossplane, it's a stateless um, controller. You, you apply the Helm chart, and there's no need for PVs or PVCs. They're just uh, controllers that are stored there, and any, any stateful information is safe in etcd. And for those type of applications, for example, even Argo CD or, or Flux, uh, you would think that if you upgrade uh, to a new version and you say, and you find a problem saying, everything works, but something doesn't work, and we have to go back, you can just change the Helm chart or change the version or go to your Git repo where Argo is watching and change the version from, for example, 1.10.2 to 1.11.0, uh, 1.11 uh, for crossplane. Well, there's an issue that you cannot roll back, and that's related on uh, when CRDs add new API versions, you cannot roll back, and there's an issue um, around that. And there's been other issues. The community is working on them, but as the community works on them, who maintains your things in production. So you have to take backups uh, for these type of things. Even for development, I, I do it because I don't want to waste my time on like waiting on another 15 minutes to create another cluster, to delete the other one. So if there's, there's an easy way that I can say, I'm going to update to a new version of Crossplane today to test something or test a pattern or make sure that it works with a new version, I'll take a backup just in case because I don't, I don't want to have a problem. So take, take, a, take a snapshot of everything in Crossplane, including everything that is inside the namespace, but all the CRDs, um, uh, CRDs and also cluster roles, cluster role bindings is uh, easy with, uh, for example, I'll show Valero for that. Another one is provider upgrades and rollbacks. So Crossplane has the concept of Crossplane the core, you can say, and then you have providers that provide, providers that provide, Providers that implement the different um, CRDs, for example, uh, you will have a provider from outbound, I'll, I'll be talking about that, that has an AWS one. You have the AWS Contrib, you have one for Helm, for Kubernetes. All these providers, what they do is they are in charge of reconciling the different type of objects that they maintain. So they, are the, they add their CRDs. So when you upgrade those CRDs uh, that are are managed by the owner, which is this version, let's say version A of the provider, and you upgrade to upgrade B, the owner would change to over. So there's issues around different providers not handling that well because that doesn't come from the cross-plane uh, community, open source. Every provider can implement their provider and they're responsible for implementing that code. So one, one issue out there is who has ownership of the CRD and you can find yourself in a deadlock. So that's another reason to have backups. And then the other one is configuration updates. Um, Crossplane has a concept of creating kind of a package that you put an image in an image and with some metadata that states, these are my, um, it has a concept of uh, packaging your compositions in Crossplane where you can man, uh, package your compositions but you can also declare what is the version of the provider, for example, outbound or the contrib AWS one, what is the minimal version that I need? And Crossplane will go and fetch that provider and do the, up, do the favor to upgrade for you uh, to the new provider. But what happens if there's a problem? It will upgrade to a version that ha I have not tested maybe, or I um, have not done the due diligence of doing backups. So that's another, uh, guidance or, or feedback, uh, a tip to, for you to consider if you're thinking of doing, doing packages, make sure that you upgrade or what version are you going to get depending what are the versions available. To me, 
Uh, I prefer to put those things in a Git repo and then have a, a GitOps controller like Argo or Flux just deploy my compositions. Um, if I make changes, it's easier to make the changes in Git. I push to Git and the composition gets deployed. Uh, that's my personal, perf uh, personal preferences, uh, preference, uh, but you can, you can use both. But I, I would prefer to have control over what gets deployed from using GitOps. Um, oh, and the, next, the last one was um, Velero. Velero has, um, uh, Velero is a software that is used to back up Kubernetes resources. Basically, the things are stored in etcd using the Kube API. Also has support for PVs and PVC, but in this concept, I'm just focusing on the CRDs. And this is something that you want to do is enable the API uh, group versions because as you create CRDs in Crossplane and there's CRDs to go for everyone. There's a bunch of CRDs. When you go to Crossplane, there's multiple API version and the open API spec for the CRDs. So you have to enable this to make sure that you back up not just the latest version, but all the versions associated with that CRD. So you don't want to be in a situation that you, when you recover, some APIs are missing and then you have a, a, a CVE. So that's something to, uh, to look into if you're using Valero or equivalents if you're using some other partner like Veeam or uh, CloudCasa or any other backup solution for Kubernetes. I added this slide because in the, in the floor of having a conversation with, with Greg, uh, uh, he has a talk today talking about Crossplane on, on this aspect of, of surf only. This is new in version 1.11 of Crossplane. Uh, you have to enable it with a, with a flag. Uh, but what this does is uh, Crossplane has now an ability to just, when you create a resource in Crossplane, it, go, it used to be by default that it goes and creates the S3 bucket or the VPC. Uh, some users were asking was, I want to create the, the resource in Kubernetes, but I want just to observe the thing that is already created. And it could be like another team was in charge of creating the VPC, uh, the subnets, the AIM policies, maybe using something like CloudFormation or Terraform. And this other team is going to deploy the cluster inside that created VPC or subnets. Um, so they want the observe only. And what Crossplane community did was uh, deprecated the delete policy, meaning that if you delete something from Crossplane, it doesn't delete the bucket of the RDS database uh, or the database. Um, and it also combined the observe only. So this is the new table. I don't know why it's not in the doc, so I'll, I'll ask uh, after today. But this is the, from the design doc on, on that. So you can have a, this field on the Kubernetes resources for your S3, for your database, and you can configure it saying like, if it gets deleted from Kubernetes, leave it orphan. Like do not, do not delete the real, the, real, the real thing because it has data, right? Um, and that's something that you want to do in production, maybe in staging or dev, you want to delete it to clean up. But also you can have the serve only or have full control. And this is uh, a pattern that you can use to say, I'm going to move, um, progress from dev, stage, and, um, and prod, and I want to maybe uh, have two prods. Maybe I'm, I'm moving one cluster to another cluster, um, and I want to test things to see if everything in Crossplane can see and can see and it can observe everything, and then change the knob to make it full control. So it allows you to go halfway there to observe, and then full to have full control. So that has the option there. Uh, that that's will be that's in the docs in the Git repo of Crossplane. Um, so in terms of disaster recovery, um, this is what most people. I don't want to say most people, but I, uh, folks that I talk to, they say like, well, if you're going to do disaster recovery, why not have the second cluster, the new cluster, just install Argo, put, put point to the same YAML that it, the other one is pointing and then let it configure everything. Well, with Crossplane, you may have two issues. Well, not Crossplane in general, but the general issue, uh, the, let's talk about the first Crossplane. So the Crossplane issue is like, if you configure the things that have the external name, that's a field in Crossplane, that it doesn't match the existing one, and you have, let's say, a thousand databases, a thousand S3 clusters, and you know, five VPCs, you will duplicate and create everything again because you have a different UUID. So you have to configure your claims, how you configure your claims and external IDs that they, they land in the same name. So that's one aspect of making sure that Crossplane does that. The second one is based on experience. And based on experience, 
when you think stuff will work, it doesn't. Who have heard that experience? Right? I'm confident I'm going to start Argo, done a dozen times, and then Sunday hits, and then the thing hits the fan. And then your wife is saying, like, why you're, why you're awake? It's Sunday, like, night, and you're not supposed to work on Sundays. So this is a, a risk thing. Like, if you're going to have prod, let's say prod one, and there's something you're going to have, and maybe you have a cluster, uh, or maybe you're going to create a cluster, you have prod two, you have to look for the fastest and easiest way to recover, not to have all the automation working on the second one. At least that's experience from my from my per personal experience. Do not focus on getting all the automation that the that the Argo comes up, that the Git can connect to the Git server, because for example, things that happen to me, uh, and also people have talked to me uh, when they do backups, they put it in S3 bucket, everything's fine, they have tested everything. Hey, it's Sunday, they want to backup. Guess what? The backup is in the other region that is down. They forgot to put the bucket in the other one. The, the, connect, the connectivity where you're, where you're backing up, you have to back up in the other one, and then this one in the other one. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is uh, they use a Git server that is not a GitHub. They might have a Git from a cloud provider that is in the other region. Uh, guess what? Another one is stuff happens with the thing that fails all the time. What's the thing that fails all the time? DNS. Oh, hi. Uh, DNS. For some reason, DNS decided not to work. Um, so anyway, I don't, I don't sh run chances. So look for the fastest way that you have a backup somewhere close to that new environment and just, and just snap, snapshot as fast as you can so you can get everything working. And then Monday, we'll figure out what happened. So in that case, uh, this is a scenario. Um, I'm working on a, on a tutorial. Uh, we have a repo I posted at, at the end uh, where we have all these examples so people can go through. So this is one example that you can configure saying like you have the Kubernetes in the West Coast. Uh, if you have put Valero on a schedule and it up backups that into an S3 bucket. And it could be an S3 bucket on that same region. But what you can do is configure replication of object storage buckets that says anything that you put in bucket one goes into bucket two. And you don't have to worry about the second region. So everything on bucket one, on a schedule, maybe nightly, monthly, hourly, Valero will put it in that bucket. The cloud provider, I guess, the one that I work for, um, it will put it in the second one, and then it will be there. And then what I will focus is when this thing happens, uh, you have to recover, just focus on getting that S3 bucket, the metadata, to etcd, right, to the cluster that you're trying to recover, and just do that. Um, I have two minutes for uh, the last scenario. The last scenario is a backup of a database. So that was the first scenario was backing up crossplane. This one is backing a, a database. So you have your database in, in one region. You have crossplane deploying it. You have Argo stating the YAML files. And the first thing that you would do is backup, uh, for example, Valero. You can use a uh, pay service or partner service, but anything that can support Kubernetes backups, in my case, I'm using an open source project called Valero that backups to the second, second bucket located in the other region, or you can do the replication of the buckets. Um, and then the RDS database using the cloud provider tools, you will backup that to an object storage, um, uh, backup that. When something happens, as the, the first region doesn't work, or there's network connectivity, or anyway, you want to decide that you want to have cross-plane installed in a different region, then you move, you work on the second region, and the buckets are there. So that was the, kind of the, the trick. Create the second cluster, install Valero in that cluster, in destination cluster, and then it will, it will uh, restore. So that restore is one-time operation that you will do. And it's okay when you're restoring and you're doing disaster recovery, it's okay to run a run book manually because it's a one-time event, like I said. So you will restore, and maybe you need uh, those features in there as a webhook. Um, so some fields um, in the cross-plane would state the region. So you don't want to say west 2, you want to say east 1. So with a webhook, you can actually change that to make sure that everything's okay, create it again in the second region, you're recreating now, 
And then on the webhook, you can mutate that and, and get that working. So that's another tip. Crossplane will create the, your new database. It's empty, doesn't have any data. Maybe taking 10 minutes or 30 minutes. If you want active active, you will need to create it beforehand. Uh, but in this case, um, I'm okay creating it, spending the 10, the 10 minutes. And then you will back up the, what you have in S3. Um, and then you can reattach Argo, right? So we're not, we're still using Argo, but that's, this is maybe a task that you would do on Monday. On Monday you come in like, well, let's reattach Argo that it goes back to the thing. Oh, by the way, we can use mutation webhooks to make sure all the, because it could be a scale, you can not deal, a scale, you can have multiple Git repos or mono repos that are very complex or a lot of Git repos that have another, needs a lot of people <laughs> buying to have a pull, a bunch of pull requests to, so that's something that you will not do on that Sunday recovering, but you can do it in the next week with the webhooks is a new, it's a way that you can mutate those uh, resources but eventually you will have all the Git repos uh, match the desired state in the new region and then the webhooks may not, may not be necessary or you can leave them there. So to, uh, as a summary, uh, everything fails uh, all the time. And like I said, it doesn't fail consistently. Uh, that's something that from experience. Uh, short path to recovery. So you want to have the, the fastest ways to recover. You don't want to do configure the whole automation when you're trying to recover. Uh, different uh, failure domains, so always make sure that you back up to the, to the place uh, that you are uh, not uh, have, like for example, the, if you're backing up to an object, object storage bucket, back up to the different region, for example. Another one is, I forgot to mention this one because it was very funny. Uh, there was an end user that put detecting when something goes wrong so they can alarm me. Well, guess what? If you are, have a cluster in the West Coast region and you're going to put some type of detection um, that is going to alert you that something's wrong, in which region would you put that detection logic or thing that runs? Who wants to guess? In the same region or a different region? Different region. Because if the region goes down, it goes, the detection goes down and then nobody calls you. So that's, it seems obvious, but it's something that comes up. Like uh, you, You'd be um, surprised. Um, Crossplane rollbacks, is some, there's something, Crossplane is something that deals with a lot of CRDs. CRDs are complicated, have different API versions, so it's good to back them up. Uh, the auto replica of, of object storage is good because you back up to one object storage and you don't have to worry about the other bucket, it's just being replicated. Um, and then the lower, the lower cost um, to recover, it like has, has high um, RTO but you can do it in certain environments. Um, and with that, uh, here are some resources on a Git repo that my team works on, on cross-plane examples for AWS, Valero, GitOps, and the EKS blueprints, which is our, uh, from my team, of all these blueprints that we use to deploy Kubernetes and EKS using Terraform, CDK, and now cross-plane as uh, best practice and, and patterns. Um, I think that's it, thank you.